The topic of this video in one sentence is, I am going to pack up and move to Tokyo, Japan, unless you have a better idea. You, yes you, someone, anyone in the audience. Because in case you haven't been following my life too closely, I really don't have a particularly good reason to be moving to Tokyo, Japan. This is much more a question of what I am moving away from rather than what it is I am moving to or into. At this moment, my mother would much prefer that I move to Montreal, which is, in case you didn't know, a city in Quebec, Canada, that's predominantly French-speaking. And I'll say this. French as a language, it may seem like a very intellectually stimulating opportunity for someone like myself. I have a great interest in French political history, the French Revolution, the failure of the French Revolution, the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, um, and that's by no means the only chapter of French political history that's interesting to me. To some extent, I'm interested in the ongoing struggle for direct democracy in France, the Gilets Jaunes and the failure of the Gilets Jaunes, and quite a few things in French politics that are warning uh, for me. And certainly I already have some kind of basis in the French language. And let's just say part of my family already resides in France. An estranged branch of my family, but... <coughs> But Quebec is not France. Is the veneer of sophistication provided uh, to a city like Montreal simply by the predominance of the French language itself? And everyone would regard that city very differently if they were speaking Spanish. Spanish is not a less sophisticated language in any way. <laughs> Spanish politics, Spanish literature, Spanish philosophy, so on and so forth. But you know, on this continent... People really look down on Mexicans. They really look down upon South American, Caribbean uh, immigrants and so on. The Spanish language is looked down upon as very unrefined and unsophisticated. And the French language is regarded as sophisticated, no matter how unsophisticated the people speaking it really are. Uh, underneath this veneer provided by the Francophone status of Montreal, it is a city very much like Detroit. It has a great deal in common with Detroit. It has a great deal in common with Cincinnati. <laughs> it has a great deal in common with second-rate and third-rate American cities, uh, especially post-industrial cities in the, in the Rust Belt. But nobody thinks of Montreal. Nobody thinks of Quebec as equivalent to Ohio. Let's put it that way. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the next stop north from Ohio, the next stop north from uh, Maine, certainly, and, and northern Michigan. And, you know, the predominant culture in Quebec and in Montreal, it's not intellectual. Um, it is certainly no more intellectual than the city of Detroit, quite possibly less. Now, for many years, we were waiting on the paperwork that would allow us, I do mean us as a couple, to live and work in the United States of America. And what we found out in the end is not so much that the particular paperwork we'd done would end in failure, but that any and all paperwork would end in failure. The opportunity was never there. It never really existed. Um, it never was possible. And many, many of the YouTube videos on this channel, and much of what I've done with my own life in the last several years, would be totally different if I had known from the outset that life in Los Angeles or life in New York City would be impossible. So we now know that it is impossible. However, the benefit of having been through the peculiar process we went through over several years of really examining how we would live in Los Angeles, how we would live in New York, and several other cities in America as well. We considered uh, New Orleans, we considered the whole coast of Florida, there was other research and other possibilities. The truth is that even if I had an American passport, if magically I were granted an American passport, perhaps not magically, perhaps as a special favor from Joe Biden. If Joe Biden hands me an American passport, I'm made an American citizen tomorrow. 
you can just barely talk yourself into making the sacrifices that are entailed to live in New York City. Uh, New York City is, is awful. It's horrendous. And it would be very, very hard for me to resign myself to living in New York, even though there are certain unique advantages to living in New York that we'll come back to. And I could repeat myself uh, with Los Angeles. I would say overall Los Angeles, it's just even more terrifying. It's even more horrible. And you even more rely on a car to do everything. <laughs> and I'm someone who's managed to live my whole life without driving a car even once. Whether you consider that an accomplishment or a lack of accomplishment, uh, regardless. <laughs> so, you know, I cannot say it's with any sadness that I found out I will never be able to live and work in New York City. And I can't say there's any sadness that I found out I will never be able to live and work in Los Angeles because I really thought of these as horrible places and terrible compromises to make. Um, I certainly thought of them as worse than living in Israel. <laughs> it's another whole story or attempt to migrate to Israel. And I certainly thought of them as much worse than living in the south of Spain. No offense to the north of Spain, but was the south really... <laughs> The north of Spain is lovely in many ways. Uh, ha, ha, ha. But anyway, you know, Andalusia, Spain, in every conceivable way, is a more appealing place for me to live than New York or, uh, or L.A. Edgy opinion here, okay? <laughs> I bet I'm going to get a lot of hate mail in response to this video. I bet there are a lot of New Yorkers who are going to say, you know, I've been to Barcelona. <laughs> I've spent some time in Andalusia. Let me tell you, Venice Beach in L.A. is... <laughs> All right, so, you know, the door swung open on the possibility of a permanent relocation to the United States because coronavirus delayed all the paperwork for years. The door seemed to stay open for a long time, and then it closed shut again. So the whole of the United States of America is not an option for us. And that is precisely why my mother imagines, you know, Montreal might be our best last hope. And <laughs> saying us, what kind of a life can I have in Montreal? And what kind of a life can Melissa have in Montreal? Um, you know, both, both are bad. But, I mean, if you really think about it seriously, I think this is even worse for, for most of the for me. I will remind you guys of a much more philosophical, much more philosophical video I made in the past that talked about the opportunity to be a jazz musician. And said, look, if you were alive in the right place at the right time, you could be a jazz musician. And if you were in Colorado <laughs> instead of Manhattan Island, you could not. Now, what are the constraints of being a jazz musician? There are many. But one of them is the existence of particular institutions, nightclubs or uh, music halls or what have you, venues where you can play uh, the music. But the most fundamental constraint is the existence of an audience that appreciates the art form, right? The existence of an audience that appreciates jazz music and other musicians who will collaborate, who appreciate you, right? So if you were in Manhattan in 1938, okay, you know, um, you, you could have been in the right place at the right time to be a jazz musician. And if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're facing insuperable obstacles. Uh, it's, not, it's not about odds. It's not about luck. No matter how great you are at playing jazz flute, the fact that you are living in Colorado in 2023 means you can never succeed. You can stand on a street corner in Colorado and play jazz flute at the highest level of skill possible, but unless you both get in a time machine and move to another city, uh, it's going nowhere. There's no, nothing, nothing further is possible. Uh, then nothing beyond practicing the art form as a form of private, for your own private satisfaction, you know, which I'm sure, I'm sure there are jazz musicians around the world where that really is the lonely path they're on. They know they're skilled and talented at the music and they have to just carry on in a kind of grim isolation. Okay, well, let me tell you something. For stand-up comedy, there is absolutely no way you can reproduce Manhattan Island on Montreal Island. <laughs> and there is no way you can reproduce the opportunities that exist in Los Angeles, in Vancouver. All right? Lots of people want to kid themselves. 
Don't kid yourself, okay? You are as misguided as a jazz musician who is packing up his or her flute and going out to the mountains of Colorado to make it in the jazz industry. If you think you can do filmmaking on the west coast of Canada or you think you can do stand-up comedy in Montreal... And, I mean, I, I am the least nationalistic person in this way. I'm not blinded by some myth of, of Canadian greatness. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, th this has been a real process of research for us, figuring out what's possible and what's impossible. And, again, um, look, <laughs> even if what you want to do is as mainstream as a Walt Disney comedy movie, let's be more specific. The Olsen Twins. You want to make the next Olsen Twins comedy movie. This is that you want to target an audience from age 12 to 14. You want to reproduce the success of the Olsen Twins. The most politically inoffensive comedy imaginable, aimed at teenagers and their parents. You're gonna <laughs> if that's what you want to do, still you can't do that in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, right? And if what you want to do in comedy, in filmmaking, whether it's documentary filmmaking, narrative, fiction, nonfiction, what have you, if what you want to do in comedy, filmmaking, or what have you, is more provocative, more edgy, more politically engaged, or if for any reason it's more of a niche market, right? Again, we're not talking about going up against enormous odds. We're talking about the difference between something being possible and impossible okay so many of the creative arts rely utterly on being in the right place and the right time so that brings us to our current situation i have studied the japanese language for two semesters at university the quality of language education i received was absolutely abysmal subject for another video uh the a length of time for per semester was much less than six months they took a full year course they cut it in half, and then they cut it in half again. So it's really only a few weeks for each semester. It was insane. Um, and you were expected to memorize an enormous amount of Japanese vocabulary. Nevertheless, I do have the level of textbook learning that comes from two semesters of university education in Japanese. I'm not starting from nothing. And we now have to look at you know, the difficult road of starting a new life in Tokyo. Why? Because... Talent is scarce. Why? I have one criterion for where I'm going to live anywhere in the world. And that is that I have to be around other dissident intellectuals. And, you know, at least hypothetically, that could be Israel. There could be enough dissident intellectuals who can speak English. <laughs> I'm never going to be at any level in Hebrew we're talking about. You know, there could be enough distant intellectuals in Israel that it's worthwhile living in Israel. It could be Paris. You know, it could be somewhere else. Check out the title of this video. If any of you have a better idea, you know, the sheer scale and intensity and the level of intellectual sophistication of Tokyo means that a meaningful life is possible there for me. Not easy, possible in a way that it is not possible in Cambodia, in Thailand, or in my opinion, so far as I know, it's not possible in Montreal and it's not possible in Detroit either. No offense. So that's what we're looking at, guys. This is really a very high stakes game we're playing. <laughs> at age 44, I neither have the time nor the money to make a whole lot of mistakes. So if you think you can prevent me from making the greatest mistake of my life, speak up now. Um, if Japan turns out to be a disaster, it'll probably have tremendous entertainment value for you in the audience, but it will be another tragedy for me. And this is a life that has already, in my opinion, been overburdened with tragedy. Um, I cannot do again in Japan what I already did in Cambodia and Laos. I can't really throw myself into Japanese as a language the way I once threw myself into the study of Korean Ojibwe, 
Pali, Laotian, many other languages and things. Um, I have had my heart broken too many times. But, you know, on the other hand, uh, when I was younger, I was going to all these places as a student, really trying to learn. And there were things you can learn doing humanitarian work in Cambodia, for example, that you can't learn in any classroom. You know, I did. Well, these were educational experiences. You know, And I'm not going to Tokyo as a student trying to learn. I'm going as an author, as a creative artist, as a YouTuber, as a comedian. I'm not going there to pursue a combination of research and humanitarian work. And I'm not going there with my hat in my hand trying to become a student at a university or get a PhD or, or anything like that. So in a sense, all I need Tokyo to be is a blank canvas because I'm going there as a creative artist, as an author and an intellectual. And it is certainly possible that Tokyo will offer me much, much more than a blank canvas. Whereas with all the research I've been done, whether I'm looking at a place like Louisiana or a place like Quebec, I, I can't even talk about this as a blank canvas. It's something worse. It's something less. Um, I think there is a real argument that living in Japan and struggling with Japanese as a language and studying, struggling with Japanese politics, Japanese history, that that's something that's going to be inspirational and positive in my life every day. I've got to tell you, struggling with life in downtown Los Angeles, it's not. There is nothing inspirational and positive about dealing with how awful life is in Los Angeles. There are things I like and appreciate about New York City. It's not. It's not. It's not inspirational. It's not wonderful. It's not educational. You're not learning anything. Not learning anything worthwhile. Not learning anything you want to learn by coping with how horrible life is in uh, in New York. And as I say, those aren't even options for us anymore. We were finally looking at Montreal as some kind of substitute for Los Angeles and New York. And as I've already explained to you, that's something it can never be. But despite the veneer of sophistication provided by you know, the French language and the challenge of, uh, of learning French and living in Montreal. I think underneath that veneer, you can say also that Montreal doesn't even offer the kind of inspirational educational quality that living in Japan will offer every day, potentially for the rest of my life.